off Canada's magnificent Pacific coast, a six-pack of fighter jets are on an attack run. Their mission? To sink the unsinkable. That was the uh, SID rep. Seven heavily armed ships are also steaming to the scene with the same goal in mind. So is a primed and armed nuclear submarine. All are converging on a single target, the once mighty HMCS Huron. It's all part of a live military strike exercise where everyone wants bragging rights as the team who sinks the destroyer. kilometers off Vancouver Island in the Pacific Northwest. Over 40 aircraft and eight warships from the US and Canada have gathered for a live attack on a Navy vessel. For the next 10 days, these ships and aircraft will undertake a simulated war. It involves the most advanced naval and combat aircraft in the world. It's called Operation Trident Fury and has been taking place annually for the past three years. Its aim, to promote battle readiness off the coast of North America. The exercise includes heavy arsenal from the United States and Canada, using the CF-18 Hornet, F-15 Eagle, AWACS, and maritime helicopters, destroyers, frigates, and to top it all off, a nuclear submarine. It's an impressive array of firepower. But this year, they've added a new twist. They've decided to sink a real warship. Real naval battles are few and far between. There hasn't been one since 1944 in the Leyte Gulf. This is a rare opportunity to test hardware to learn how the various weapons systems will perform in actual combat. Uh, okay. And this is the target, the destroyer HMCS Huron. Docked at Esquimalt, British Columbia, the decommissioned Huron has been chosen for a live fire exercise during Operation Trident Fury. She's been stationed here for more than six years while all toxic waste and hydrocarbons have been cleaned from the vessel. It's a unique project, and fierce competition has broken out amongst the teams to be the first to sink it. It's not confined to the naval tacticians. The Air Force has entered the game, upping the ante. If you think about the combat power and capability of 30 F-18s, either in an air-to-air -air role or air-to-ground, all carrying bombs and missiles, uh, we figure we got the most effective combat force. Of course, the Navy tends to think uh, they do with their uh, destroyers and frigates. The Air Force will be up there with a lot of their expensive assets and, and taking shots at it, but when it comes down to it, we're going to be firing 76 millimeter rounds into the ship, and they're going to be dropping 20 millimeter bullets on it, and somebody's going to take it down, it'll be us. It's like we're all grown-ups, but uh, we all like a little bit of competition uh, goes a long way, especially for morale. I can see this, that uh, they're definitely not going to sink it before we do. The goal, to sink the destroyer using live fire. But it's not as easy as firing some missiles into her. Warships are designed to stay afloat under extraordinary circumstances. So combat teams will have to figure out the best way to attack Huron. Algonquin is a Canadian destroyer, the command ship for Operation Trident Fury. It's the sister ship of Huron and almost an exact duplicate. By firing on Huron, she'll not only learn how to sink a warship, but her own tactical weaknesses as well. The irony is not lost on the team. 
This is Coxon Taylor. He's a senior officer on Algonquin. The sinking exercise, or SYNCX, brings up mixed emotions for Taylor. On one hand, he would be proud to deliver the fatal blow, but on the other, he has a deep affection for Huron. He served as her combat chief for a year and a half. She just had a, a really good spirit about her. It's, it's hard to describe, but when you get to a ship, they all have their own personalities. It was a fighting spirit, positive, great environment to work in. One of those uh, places uh, everybody wants to sail on because she had such a good reputation. Huron is a tribal class destroyer launched in 1971. She's nearly 130 meters long, weighing more than 4,200 metric tons. A gas turbine engine propels the destroyer to over 30 knots. But she's not just fast, she's smart. And when Huron was launched, she was top of her class, loaded with all the latest in radar, sonar, and missile systems. Huron was built in the midst of the Cold War. Her primary job was to hunt enemy submarines and aircraft off the coast of North America. In her prime, she utilized the Sea Sparrow launch system. The Sea Sparrow missiles were originally developed as an air-to-air -air system, so versatile it could defend from any direction. Technology was the key to gaining the upper hand, and Huron was one of the most sophisticated destroyers in the world. Over 30 years, thousands of men and women served on her. In 2005, she was paid off and decommissioned. She might have ended up in the scrapyard when the Navy decided to put her into service one last time. Well, you know, it's kind of a mixed feeling. Uh, you, you look across the harbor and you see the ship that you used to sail on rusting away and, uh, you know, just looking worse and worse every day. And that's never a good feeling when you've served on a, on a ship that had so much pride. Cox and Taylor and many others who served on Huron are now out to sink her as part of Operation Trident Fury. Thinking about sinking her was kind of difficult when I first thought about it, but then I started to, to reflect on what would a warship, uh, you know, if it had its own choice, what would it want? And I think it would want to go down in one last gunfight. So in a final act of service, Huron will provide training to a new generation of sailors and ships. Nowadays, the military relies heavily on computer simulations but nothing can replace a live exercise to test the effectiveness of weapons and the survivability of a warship. Such information will lead to future ship design and weapons development. There will be at least six weapons systems being used against Huron. The 57 millimeter cannon, capable of firing 200 rounds per minute. You sure you got the target? Permit, sir, we are locked on. Roger. Number 15. Number 15. And the 76 millimeter cannon, firing 120 rounds per minute. The Sea Whiz, or close in weapon system. Firing over 4,500 rounds per minute. This impressive machine sends out a spiral of lead to intercept any incoming missiles and aircraft. The Sea Sparrow, a defensive missile capable of taking out both air and sea targets. It's almost as long as a car and moves at more than three times the speed of sound to meet incoming threats. The CF-18 fighter jet, which is equipped with laser-guided bombs and a Gatling gun, that can discharge over 100 bullets a second. And finally, 
the USS Topeka, a nuclear submarine loaded with a ship-breaking Mark 48 torpedo. Still on shore, a crew is rehearsing. When Huron arrives at the sink site, a demolition team is to board the vessel and remove temporary navigation lights and flood sensors, equipment added to make the vessel safe to tow. The warship has been stripped of all other environmental contaminants, and this equipment will have to be removed before the operation begins. Carl Hestudal and Steve Mandy lead the team. They must locate the equipment and all the dangers. The tripping hazards are extreme. The hatches are all gone. You could easily fall down the hatches. And the stability of the ship when it's at sea. The fact that it's going to move a little bit more on normal than any ship that uh, will be fitted out with all its machinery. But we still need to know there's an escape from the back here. Yeah, from back in the VDS one. Once offshore, the ship will not have any power. So Steve Mandy improvises a lighting system. We're placing chem lights throughout the corridors of the ship so that we can find our way to and from safe entrance ways in and out and any hazards we may come across. So when we, when we board the ship, as we make our way in, we'll activate them and that way we can find our way out. It is easy to get lost in the maze of passages, rooms and stairs. And this poses a truly frightening scenario for the demolition team. If there's an emergency or the ship starts to sink prematurely, they need to get out fast. In its current state, Huron is a floating hazard. The integrity of the vessel has been compromised by welding doors and hatches open. It has not been out to sea in years. No one knows how it will react. It will be critical for everyone to know exactly where they are and the quickest way out. Carl doesn't like what he sees. The team's safety is in his hands. No, we're not coming back here. There's no way. If we come back here, we're being silly. This is good. This, I don't want anyone to go back anyway. Back. If we have to go to Tiller Flats, unless we're escaping, we're going through the upper deck. There's no way we need to be going through here. This is too far forward. What makes their job difficult is the hundreds of rooms that make up the interior of this warship. At 129 meters and weighing more than 4,200 tons, it was built strong to survive hunting submarines in the stormy North Atlantic. Strength came from having individual watertight compartments, and a series of bulkheads across the beam provided the ability to isolate sections flooded during a breach. All this is to protect the nerve center of the warship, the operations control room. From here, the exterior mounted radar and weapon systems are controlled. Surface to air missiles, a 76 millimeter gun, Mark 46 torpedoes, and a Phalanx 20 millimeter Sea Whiz, making this warship a formidable foe. One of the most important pieces of equipment to keep the warship action ready is the Sea King helicopter. As aerial eyes and ears, the Sea King extends the warship's range beyond the horizon, hunting for threats in the surface and subsurface realms. It has a crew of four, two pilots, a tactical coordinator, and one airborne electronic sensor operator who runs the submarine hunting equipment. Like fixed-wing aircraft, these helicopters can pick up fuel while on the move. With a maximum range of 648 kilometers and a potential flight speed of 211 kilometers an hour, the Sea King extends the ship's forward defenses. If you were a betting man, one of the favored ships in the competition would have to be HMCS Regina. It will start the attack on Huron. 
The responsibility for the success or failure of the operations falls on Captain Couture's shoulders. Let's do it right and let's do it quick. Okay, get on with it. Captain Couture is looking forward to the opportunity to test his team and provide them with realistic combat experience. Roger, coming up to 26 knots and that course of 115. To prepare for the real thing, they tune up their weapon systems. Captain, sir, I have a clear range of area 095, permission to carry a firing run. Here we have another firing up. Yep. Oh, Roger. Gun beat on the bridge. Success depends on effective communication between navigation and combat systems. The bridge, which is the captain's domain, handles the maneuvering of the vessel. Deep within the ship, is the operations control center. In this dark room are the ship's eyes and ears. It's full of the latest high-speed computers, providing a constant stream of information from an array of sensors and radars. The ops room has four sections. The front rows are the combat information operators. They fine-tune radar readouts and talk to other ships on secure channels. On the port side are electronic warfare operations. They fire guns and missiles. On the starboard side are the acoustic operators, the anti-submarine specialists, watching and listening to the underwater world. And in the back row overseeing all the action are the senior officers. They're next in command to the captain. Called war directors, these sailors take in two-dimensional information from a computer screen and turn it into a three-dimensional battle scene. And what they see are three levels of potential threats. Air, surface, and subsurface. This system is taking command and control decisions on tactical and strategic operations to new levels. Regina's weapon systems are fully automatic and can defend the ship without human intervention. However, the Navy is not ready to place all its trust in computers. The final orders are still based on the captain's experience and instincts something a computer has yet to replace. In order for the captain to make an informed decision, he relies on information from the operations room officer. Uh, it's our job uh, as the anti-submarine warfare director and the above water warfare director to put together the surface picture so that command has a clear idea when they make a decision to engage or not to engage that they're doing the right thing. The warfare director's greatest concern may not necessarily be from the surface or air. It may be from the deep. One of the deadliest enemies of ships is the submarine and its lethal weapon, the Mark 48 torpedo. Not to be forgotten, submarines are an important part of this war game. In 1999, the terrible power of this weapon was demonstrated against a naval destroyer similar to Huron. This is the Australian ship Torrens, and this is HMAS Famcom. Famcom was tasked with sinking the destroyer using a Mark 48 torpedo. The Mark 48 uses a proximity fuse detonation. This means when the torpedo explodes directly beneath the hull, it creates a massive air pocket into which the ship sinks, literally breaking its back. A shock wave then drives the broken hull up and splits the ship apart. It's like a giant has ripped the ship in two. This kind of weapon 
gives sailors nightmares. And if the ships and air force don't sink Huron, this will be her fate. In the lead up to the Sinkex, testing of weapons begins as soon as possible to ensure that everything is working properly. On Regina, crew members put on protective gear, anti-flash guard wear, as well as a flak jacket in case of shrapnel. They're preparing to launch Sea Sparrow surface-to-air missiles. The Sea Sparrow is a highly maneuverable surface-to-air missile. It packs a wicked punch and can blow enemy aircraft out of the air. Before they're allowed on the range, the Sea Sparrows have to be live tested. This is the Vindicator drone. It acts like an enemy missile or aircraft attacking the ship. This is when the ops room begins to work. As soon as the Vindicator is in range, the weapons zero in. System target error unobserved, 336, 24,000 yards, height 4,600 feet, 157, speed 157. Negative response, warning two, 6157. Once they have a clear lock, they are given the order to fire. Saw shoot! A system, missile away! A system, missile away! Two surface to air missiles are launched. A system, kill! Both hit the target. The operation is off to a good start. But the Sea Sparrow will not be used against an airborne target. It's being used against another ship. This will be the first time that they've fired on a surface target. The question on the team's mind is, can the Sea Sparrow sink Huron? If so, they could end this competition before it even gets started. Just before the sink X begins, all the warships take on fuel. In Navy jargon, it's known as a replenishment at sea, or RAS. It's a way of transferring fuel, munitions, and stores from one ship to another while underway. This is the tanker ship USNS John Erickson. It's part of the military sea lift fleet, roaming the world refueling US Navy vessels. 200 meters long, it's twice the length of a football field, carrying over 180,000 barrels of fuel, enough to refuel 119 747 jumbo jets. Each of the receiving frigates carries 500 tons of fuel. That gives them a range of 9,500 nautical kilometers. That's one quarter of the way across the planet without refueling. But out here, the engines are under heavy use and the fuel tanks quickly run low. The dual diesel gas engines consume over 1.6 tons an hour, steaming at 15 knots. The Navy ships approach from behind and line up beside the tanker ship. Welcome back alongside USMS John Erickson. Stand by for shot lines midship. A line gun launches a messenger cable between the vessels. Once connected, it's a carefully coordinated dance to hold precisely the same course and speed, or fuel lines will be ripped apart. The Ericsson travels at 13 knots, or 24 kilometers per hour. But the receiving ship has to maintain exactly a half a knot more. Once on course and maintaining 30 meters apart, the fuel hose is hoisted over and connected. Everyone stays alert as the heavy fuel probe swings close by. We 
If the ships were to quickly part, this device is meant to break away. But the explosive parting could injure, even kill, anyone near it. With all vessels refueled, the Syncax can begin. One of the main weapons being tested during Syncax is the SeaWiz, or close-in weapon system. It can track quickly along the horizon and elevate nearly straight up. The six barrels provide a very high rate of fire, about 75 rounds per second. But what really sets it apart from other machine guns is its ability to think for itself. The Sea Wiz is radar guided, built to track and take down incoming missiles, aircraft, and rockets. Controlled by a computer, this is the ultimate Terminator. A column of lead travels to intercept the missile and, like a steel shredder, tears it apart. The Sea Wiz holds 1,550 rounds, but after each firing session has to be reloaded by hand. 86-pound boxes of ammo are lifted and placed into the belt feeds. The manual reload is a significant downside to this weapon. It's dawn of the big day. The Navy and Air Force have an ambitious schedule of weapons testing to get underway. Before the operation can begin, the demolition team returns to the drifting Huron. They can now remove the remaining navigational and flood control equipment. Team members like Mike Hales live for these moments, but it never gets easier no matter how many times he does it. Well, I haven't seen the weather outside, so a little nervous anxiety. Yeah. 4.49. It's oh dark. But they are not the only ones concerned. This is the helicopter crew that will transfer the EOD team to the Hulk. They have never worked with this particular demolition team before. They are concerned that because Huron is so unstable, the ship could roll or sink prematurely with the demolition team on board. Then they'd be performing a sea rescue of survivors, or worse, a recovery of bodies. The ship's a bobbing corkscrew out in the middle of the Pacific here, and the, the Huron has a tendency to go a beam to the wind. So basically, the wind's going to be coming on like that, and it's going to be wiggling all over the place. At last, airborne. Instructions are given in case of a crash landing. Sea King helicopters are a rare breed. They live and work on board a ship, flying over water most of the time. Despite continuous offshore takeoffs and landings, no one takes them for granted. In this dramatic footage, as a Sea King approaches a destroyer, we see the worst can happen at any time. But the team can't let fear overcome them, or they will compromise the mission. Once the helicopter drops them on the deck, they are completely on their own. What we'll be doing is we'll be loading on the helicopter here, flying over in a hover pattern over top of the old flight deck, 
put a horse collar on and they're going to lower us down to the deck of the Huron. The most inherent danger in getting on board the Huron would be lowering down. So coming up to the edge of the helicopter, being lowered down on, but then it's your footing. The deck itself is, is all unstable. There's a lot of fittings that are exposed that normally are not there. This is a rare look into a dangerous operation. Petty Officer Second Class Stephen Mandy has a camera mounted on his helmet, taking us into a world no civilians have ever seen. The lessons he learned while Huron was dockside will be put to the test. The plans have to be executed perfectly and according to a rigid schedule. The EOD team has two boxes to remove from Huron. Steve and Chris head to the stern to retrieve the flood sensors and temporary navigation beacons. The rest of the team heads to the bow. Circling overhead, the helicopter stands by to lift off the box of gear. Zero hour is 30 minutes away. The fleet begins to take their positions and calibrate their weapon systems. Back on Huron, Steve disconnects the power from the flood sensors. The batteries that operate them contain toxins that are harmful to the environment and have to be removed. The Sea King helicopter airlifts the first power box off the bow section. With the box dropped, the helicopters are returning to airlift off the demo team. And if they're not on schedule, the entire sink plan could be thrown into jeopardy. Chris and Steve struggle with the last cable. Time is melting away. To go up, we have to go to the front, that's deviating. With the fleet standing by, they can't afford to waste any more time with the cable. They cut it. It's time to leave Huron. If all goes well, this will be the last time any humans will walk this deck. Exciting. It's actually uh, nice to be able to go on a ship and do a job and actually see a ship go down to the bottom. It's, it's really a, a good feeling. It is, it's a high adrenaline rush. I love doing this. The demolition team heads back to base. Now the battle can begin. At the Comox base on Vancouver Island, the CF-18 fighter pilots prepare for one of the most exciting missions of their career, attacking a destroyer. This is the CF-18. It has two engines, each generating 16,000 pounds of thrust. Moving at Mach 1.8, it's equipped with a lethal array of weapons that can take down just about anything. John Waugh, known as Streak, 
will take the point for the Air Force attack against Huron. It's really exciting. We live bullets, live bombs. Things are going to explode. It's uh, it's what we it's what we uh, work for. It's what we train to. So this is you know most exciting day of the mission of the whole exercise for us right here. So it's uh, going out in the sink a ship. The most impressive part of the CF-18 is the Vulcan M61 Gatling gun. It's a low-tech but powerful machine gun for close-in air-to-air dogfighting. This six-barreled machine gun can fire up to 100 rounds per second. More than 570 rounds are held within the ammunition handling system. That's less than 10 seconds of fire time during a mission. The entire unit is compact enough to be mounted into the airframe of the CF-18. But is this enough to sink a ship? They're fairly heavily armored, especially on the sides. But if you put the rounds down the top, there's not a lot of armor along the top of them. So if you can actually get it on a proper angle coming downwards, it'll go right through. We're traveling about 450 knots, so when we roll in, we only have seven to 10 seconds of uh, before the boat gets too close, we gotta pull up and get out of the way. So it's pretty exciting to roll in, do a little bit of uh, check your parameters, make sure uh, everything's going good, move the pipper, which is where the bullets are gonna hit, onto the part of the boat that you wanna hit, squeeze the trigger for about half a second or so, and then uh, get away real quick up and to the left before the, uh, any shrapnel or fragments come up. As the action picks up on the water, the jet fighters get ready to roll. The attack on the destroyer is set to start in minutes. Which of the many weapon systems will win the day? Each team hopes to make the final kill. The frigates and destroyers are positioning themselves into an attack formation. There are two destroyers and four frigates on the range. This may be the most powerful naval arsenal gathered on the seven seas. It's zero hour and Huron is now free drifting and the fleet is in position. First up to bat is Regina, followed by Algonquin. Bringing up the rear are Kurtz, Saskatoon, Alert, and Shoop. Standing by for the underwater portion is the USS Topeka, prepared to fire the Mark 48 torpedo. Aboard Regina, the weapons crew are doing last minute repairs. Her 57 millimeter gun has jammed, and Master Seaman Jefferson is not sure if they're going to get it up and running in time. The round didn't probably that early feed, so it didn't make it to the ramming position before it flicks it in the reach, which happens from time to time. So we don't know why. All we can do is go up there, look at it, rectify it, set it up for firing again. They'll have to work fast, or they'll be dropped from the attack formation. In the meantime, Regina moves in to launch the Sea Sparrow. For the live fire exercise, a new function has been added. The Sea Sparrow will be tested as a ship-to-ship -ship weapon. Will it work in this mode? Best thing that happens is uh, we do the exercise, we get all the information that we wanted, and get some missiles into the uh, Huron, and we sink it, hopefully, and nobody else. Okay. All positions uh, sweet. We are going to carry on with the uh, uh, SAS engagement uh, against uh, X Huron, and now bearing 297, 15,000 yards. Thanks so much, Roger. Okay, bridge team, we're clear to fire. The operations room brings the missiles online and zeroes in on Huron. All your missiles is Romeo Delta, splash one time, slow, slow flyer. Now, let's make it easy. Saws, gun track while scanned. Yeah, keep going. Oral spec recommend engage at uh, 3,500 yards. Check bearer, engine at four. Check Laro, take X Huron. Swick Roger. Saws, shoot! Regina's having problems. Nothing happens. It's another misfire. Such a malfunction could be the difference between life and death during a real battle. 
they only have five minutes to fix the problem, or the next vessel takes their position to maintain the battle rhythm. But within seconds, they're back online. The second Sea Sparrow launches. swallowed a missile. Interesting enough, uh, where the missile impacted would have gone right into the missile deck of the ship. If uh, she had been loaded with missiles, it would have been a mess. The warhead has impacted into Huron's missile silos, located right below and in front of the bridge. Regina closes on Huron and prepares to fire using the 57 millimeter Mark II. It's a lightweight cannon with a special servo system that keeps the gun locked on to a moving target. Compensating for the movement of the ship, reducing aiming errors. Computer controlled from the operations room using radar and infrared imaging. But has the crew been able to fix the loading mechanism? Range. Range, 1,870 yards, sir. That's as good as it's going to get. Okay, from the test right here, load the 3P. Aye, sir. The shells explode beside the target, spraying it with shrapnel. These explosions would have been enough to cause human casualties on board Huron. But Huron is not listing and shows no signs of taking on water. Now Regina moves in closer to fire the Sea Whiz. Designed for small incoming targets, the radar has trouble locking on to Huron, a potential problem using the weapon this way. But using manual override, they are able to fire on the Hulk. The Regina has done significant damage, but has not delivered the fatal shot. The rest of the fleet moves in. Each will try to deliver the death blow. After the pummeling, Huron shows no signs of sinking. Algonquin moves in. Some of the crew are a little uneasy about participating in the attack. The gun that's on the Algonquin right now, the 76 on the front, used to be the gun that was on the Huron. So some of the guys said uh, they don't want to put any uh, ammo into the Huron with their 76 because that's her old gun and it's bad, bad karma. It wouldn't be good luck. Mixed feelings aside, the crew opens up the 76.
The glowing shells are fired at 80 rounds per minute. Get her on, girl. The CF-18s are in the air. Before they make their run on Huron, they're going to take on fuel. The pilots don't want to miss out on their chance to sink the ship. Meanwhile, Algonquin is seeing the results of its attack. I don't know if the fighters are going to even make it out here for a run. If we're lucky, they won't. <laughs> The old crew of Huron has gathered on the deck of Algonquin. As they watch, Huron's own gun finds its mark. It's a major blow. Huron starts to list. This could be the end. Well, we just did another firing run with the 76 mil, and uh, the Huron is actually heeling over to uh, starboard. You can see most of her flight deck and uh, and hang her top from here, which means she's taking on a lot of water. The CF-18 fighter jets scramble for a strafing run. Oh, this is uh, Bravo 43. We are Charlie Charger. Using the high-powered forward-looking infrared, Streak doesn't like what he sees. Got a heavy list to our been hit already. Yeah. Huron is sinking but the jets still have time to attack. Come on, baby, you can do it! <laughs> Don't let those fighter jocks touch you! <laughs> they begin their plunge from about 2,000 meters, straight down. Target locked, the Vulcan unleashes a stream of lead. Pulling up, they reach a gut-wrenching 6 Gs, more than an astronaut on a shuttle launch. The CF-18s attempt one last pass before Huron disappears. Streak opens fire. Altitude. Altitude. Oh, no, no, no. Oh. Hold her down. Hold her. She's going down. But it's too late. The Navy has already won the day. It's a spectacular end to a veteran warship. Huron sinks before the submarine can break her back with a Mark 48 torpedo. The rivalry is over, and it's time to pay their respects. See the Kirk? She's got her battle ensign flying. Like they're honoring the Huron. With the missile attacks and bombing behind her, she's left to slip beneath the waves. Taylor calls for silence to honor the ship that served her country for 30 years. Stand still! The emotions begin to take hold. Well, a little bit mixed. It's nice to see her uh, in that way, but it's also hard to see her in. So. It's good. It's a good, good day. It will take months to analyze the data from the sink exercise. The vulnerability of Huron to a direct attack has generated a new respect for the arsenal. It took us a little back, certainly in a moment that will be captured in our memories for a long time. The clear winners are the warships and their crews who sank Huron. bringing the Syncex to a surprise finish before the jets or submarine even had a chance.